God's voice. You know God's voice. Uh, last week was talking about the Holy Spirit with power. We didn't get a diminished gift. We didn't get something different than they had in Acts chapter 2. We didn't get less power. We didn't get a gift where the Holy Spirit came without power. And power indicates something that's tangible, palpable, recognizable, measurable. If it's power that you can't know is there, it's not very powerful at all. So if it's not detected, well, if I receive the Holy Spirit, but I, I can't detect any power, is it because it's not there, or is it possibly that it's just simply not detected? doesn't mean it's not detectable. Uh, do our power detectors need some help? A broken Geiger counter in the middle of a nuclear blast won't detect anything. And so if we don't hear God's po uh, voice, somebody would say, well, he's not talking. Or somebody else would say, well, he hasn't given us spiritual ears yet so we can hear. Uh, but I believe... We can learn how, everybody that's a believer in Christ can learn how to tune into his voice and listen. And it's almost like a flood of people down into the subway and you know, so you, so you see this crowd just pushing and shoving to get in the car. And among the crowd is this, uh, this uh, special person that uh, you can't miss them if you saw them, but you've got about 10,000 people going down and you just, you haven't picked them out. Now, God's voice is very much recognizable. It's distinct. You may have thousands of thoughts crowding your head, but there is a message that doesn't stop coming from God that's mixed in with all that stuff. That if you want to find it and know what to look for, and it's different from all the others. It's not the same. I think meditating on Scripture while we're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, being a Spirit-filled person, which is all the time, right? Yes. Sharpens our Christ in us sensors, detectors. It sharpens them. Um, and the concern is, well, Christians that become too subjective and experiential become really goofy sometimes. And I'll say, yeah, absolutely true. Uh, but I believe it's also true that we can learn to recognize God's voice subjectively and experientially without becoming mystical, spooky, hyper-spiritual, emotion-guided or feeling-based people. While uh, we can tune into the Holy Spirit while remaining solidly Scripture-based. The Bible says, and it's, it's, let every fact be established on the basis of two or three witnesses. And sometimes we'll grab a Scripture out of the Bible and say, well, it says it. Well, it'd be nice to have two, other three, two or three other clear uh, declarations of that to confirm the truth, to confirm we're understanding that particular verse right. So we can have the solidity of uh, confirmed scripture. We can have good friends to counsel us and tell us we're going weird, becoming a little crazy. We can be part of a church family, uh, not independent, but the Trinity doesn't have to split up in order to be free. The Holy Spirit doesn't have to pull off and say, okay, I am stuck in a rut with the Father and the Son. <laughs> Everything I do has to be just like them all the time. And it's been that for infinity. you got to understand, I need some freedom here. That doesn't happen. That doesn't have to happen. Because we're misunderstanding freedom, if we think that way. Psalm 88, uh, 68, verse 6 says, God sets the solitary in families. 
Now, some of us may not, we may be sitting in crowds, but in our heart, we're solitary. In our heart, we don't have those family bonds. We may go to a church for 50 years, but we may not have those bonds established. God sets solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious live in a dry land. And he's not talking about just physical water here. He's talking about the internal. And so there are benefits and blessings that come in the family world that God wants to put us all in. And within the framework of mutual submission and mutual respect with other people, as in the Trinity, the life of the Holy Spirit flows freely in that framework. John 5, verse 39, says, Jesus speaking to the religious people of his day, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. That's kind of shocking, isn't it? And these are they which testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have the life they're pointing to. Now, I believe uh, is the word of God life. I I believe uh, Hebrews 4.12, word is life. Ten verses earlier, you need to understand Hebrews 4.2, it says, but it doesn't help you unless it's mixed with faith. So, well, is it alive or not? Yeah. But you better have some faith in the mix if it's going to impart to you what you need to get. So another way of putting that, this is just my words, but scriptural brain knowledge requires the Holy Spirit's help in revealing it to do us any good. It's like the exit sign back there over the door. Uh, it gets smoky in here, and you see that sign, and, and uh, you go to the side, and it directs you to the door. You get out, and you get the fresh air. And you go, thank God for that sign. It saved me. Now, the sign didn't save you. The fresh air saved you. But the sign led you to the fresh air. And this Bible is saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Now, you can hug that exit sign all you want, and it's going to get hot. Or you can go to where it's pointing. One danger is that we can, when we try to learn how to, which is a growth thing, we try to learn how to hear the Holy Spirit. You saw us growing and trying to grow today. You try to hear the Holy Spirit, and we can become independent and irrational in that process. But there's another danger that I think is, needs to be watched out for, and that's it's possible for us to live a rank-and-file, cookie-cutter Christianity conforming to church culture. Codes, policies, norms, have all of our scriptural knowledge Alphabetical order in our Rolodex. All our ducks in a row. And still not depend on the Holy Spirit of whom these same scriptures testify to. Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. But I will send you another comforter. He will teach you. He will lead you. So the question is, has Jesus sent that comforter? Easy answer. Have you received him? You know his voice. God says you do. You may not detect it, but it's detectable. (laughs) Recognizably distinct. Apart from the thoughts of your own mind. John 10, verse 1. Thank you, Brian, for doing that. Brian works hard on Sundays. I mean, we're not the hugest organization in the Christian globe, but man, we got some hardworking people here. Uh, Thanks, Cells, for all you do, and the others, Cheryl, goes on and on. John 10, verse 1. Most assuredly, I say to you, He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, those were the leaders of Israel trying to own the people. 
The same is a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name. He doesn't just whistle for the group. Come on, flock. He goes, Dior. He goes, Rod. And he calls by name. Why is that important? Because knowing his voice and hearing his voice is so individual, so personal. And he leads them out, and when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. It's almost redundant here. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Verse 13. The hireling flees because he's a hireling, does not care about the sheep. People that are in the ministry for fame or fame, for money, whatever. I'm the good shepherd and I know my sheep. And I'm known by them, my own. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. Are you his sheep? Yes. Yeah. And I know them and they follow me. And I give them unstable and insecure uh, signals and directions, and everyone has to wonder how weird they really are. I give them eternal life, not life till their next sin. It's, it's eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. I and the Father are one, and nobody's going to snatch them out of his hand. Does that sound like security for you? See, I'm not talking about an unstable lifestyle. Uh, I grew up Assembly of God. Thank God for it. A lot of good came from that. And um, um, I think I was... uh, Do you ever realize years later how proud you've been? And it might mean that you're still maybe more proud than you know. (laughs) I, I would look at, you know, we had our deacon Dave, you know, and... He is signing checks because God told him to, and they, you know, send good old Deacon Dave off to jail. And I, I thought, man, if these guys really knew God's voice as much as they said they did, their lives would be something different than they seem to be. Uh, well, that was my pride speaking, you know. It's, and I determined in my heart, in my pride, and I'm not saying this is a good thing, this is a bad thing. It was me thinking myself something that I wasn't. I, I was thinking, I'm, I'm never going to say. I'm never going to say that. It's kind of like uh, the boxer, huh? I'm never going to say that I know his voice. Uh, Like a boxer, I'll do my talking in the ring. I don't need to boast about it up front. I'll show you. I'll I'll do my playing on the field. Watch me. I'll talk out. You know, kind of like, oh man, how sick was that? And uh, I was pastoring, and after, for about three years, literally, about five different times we had folks with Good gifts, good abilities would come in. And for, for three years, God was telling me, he'd say in front of the whole church, he'd say, Bob, you know my voice. A few months later, Bob, you know my voice. About the fifth time after three years, Bob, why are you tormenting yourself? You know my voice. And it just had a little more of a firm tone than it had before. And I, about that time, I went into a year of just marriage chaos. We had a church of about 1,000, but we had five church leaders that were all at once. They all decided, we're going to break loose and divorce now. Oh, they're divorcing. We'll divorce too. And, uh, and so the divorce snowball started gaining momentum. And I was going, to, I'm going to stop this thing. Uh, Evie and Dick were, at that time, parting ways and... Oh, boy. So my sister, who is a worship leader, and my brother-in-law, they're, they're, it was all happening, and I'm going, oh, God. I was getting advice around the country. and So I've been, gone through a year of this, just how do I handle this? What's the Bible say? Divorce, remarriage, how does it all work? And uh, I was really needing to hear from God. Uh, so uh, John Paul Jackson, how many have heard of John Paul Jackson? Okay, some of you. Uh, But he's part of the infamous Kansas City prophet ring, you know, that uh, with uh, Mike Bickle, Bob Jones, others. And um, 
he was in the area here, and so there, uh, there are about 30 of us that were spending a couple days with him. And uh, if anybody needed to hear from God, I did. I knew I did, because I was bleeding out. And, uh, and I was there, and all 30 of them heard something from God through John Paul Jackson, and I didn't. And now, I've never believed it's okay to get mad at God. I mean, just, I mean, it, even if you want to throw a fit, it just doesn't even make sense. But uh, on this particular occasion, I threw my fit. Uh, I entered into a cathartic little season and um, that lasted a couple days. I, this particular dilemma in myself... <laughs> Because God was saying, why do you need to hear me through somebody else? When are you going to know I'm talking to you? So I was in the car, and uh, man, I was so emotionally strung out because I had this, for me, a foundational breakup on, down in the bottom of my being, and I mean, I was sweating like I was in a shower from just emotion. And uh, it was serious. <laughs> I went home and uh, the whole world went away. It was God and I wrestling. And I think we were not because he was imposing anything on me. I think he knew I wanted him to help me. Thank you. <laughs> and I didn't know how to help get his, I didn't know how to help him help me. I didn't know how not to fight. My pride was too strong. And so, man, in the middle of the night, I took off at the car, and, uh, but it was supernatural beyond what I can try to describe. But no fun. Uh, you just be, thank God you weren't there. And uh, I saw myself in this building and later in the night, and I, I wasn't sinning, I wasn't out doing anything wrong, but I ended up in this dirty bar. <laughs> I'm at a counter. I had seen before going out of this building, and that, that bar was it. And on the, the, the thing I saw in my mind as I headed out the car was I saw two tacos of all things. I get to the bar and the guy said, sorry, we don't have anything to give you but two tacos. And I, I said, no, thank you. This is all too strange. And before it was over, I felt like God was pinning me uh, on the ground saying, okay, are you going to give up? <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, and this is what he said. He said, I saw myself on a hill. I saw a family coming down in a car around a corner. I saw another car coming. I saw a crash. I saw the family would be lost. And then I realized that was a, a, a view of something about to happen. And then I saw a car coming down. I saw it happening again. <laughs> And God said, Bob, this isn't about you. There are things that are going to happen that you need to talk to. I'm going to talk to you and you need to ring it out like a bell. And people will be saved. Whew. And so... Uh, he said it was Wednesday and we had about 400 people coming for the regular Wednesday night service. I don't know if Dean and Dean remember this. Do you remember? I don't know. And uh, I just did the teaching and we're at the end of it. And, and I said, God told me to tell you that I know his voice. Now that was a commitment I had made in my pride. I, I'm never going to say that. I'm never going to say that. And he said, Bob, go say it. Go tell him. I got up. I said, folks, I'm here to announce to you tonight, I know God's voice. <laughs> Man, that was hard to do. Because I had about 20 years of fight going into that. Uh, 400 people lined up. We went. It was sunrise before we were done. 
they lined up in front of me and they waited all night long. As soon as the first one got in front of me, no kidding, I saw a screen. And I saw the script coming down across the screen. And I just read it. That's all I did. I just read. Next one comes up. <laughs> just read the thing. And uh, one of the people ministered to that night, uh, Bob Cherry, know real well. He lives out in Kikarmin now. He's a character. But he got saved, but he's a character. And, uh, and he came up and he said, look, I'm not going to believe anything you say unless you can tell me something that happened and I know that God's talking through you. Prove it. And I was telling him, no, I, I, that's not appropriate. That's not, you know, I can't do that. Uh, but as I was telling them that, no kidding, I saw a car, I saw a parking lot, I saw just that side of the nose bridge, I saw Tuesday night written across the top. I saw him get out of the car. I saw him open up the trunk. I saw him get, uh, there were quilts in the trunk. I saw him get a quilt out. I saw him go to the other passenger door. I saw, I could have seen anything. I could see into his glove compartment. Well, Bob, that's cool. You got a real good gift. I'll tell you, I don't have a real good gift. That wasn't a gift. When did God talk to me. Well, God started talking to you. He had been talking to me for years and telling me, you know my voice. Not you will know my voice. You know it. But I could not believe it enough to pay attention to it. I'll tell you, the Holy Spirit is in that crowd of thoughts you have going through your head. And God's saying, he's in there. (laughs) You can find him. Pay attention. And he's not like everybody else. Within two weeks, John Bushnell comes up. Says, I had a dream last night. And he tried a Nebuchadnezzar thing. And I'm not going to tell you what the dream is until you tell me what it is so that when I hear the interpretation, I'll know that you're... I go, John, you can't do that. You're putting God to the test. No, he's putting me to the test. And... uh, and while I was telling that, no kidding, these gold rings, wedding rings, started dancing in front of me. And I described the dream, and it had to do with his marriage, what the rings did, how they interacted, what they did. He had been talking to me for years, and he said, you know my voice. And he didn't just start talking, I began believing and paid attention to it. But it was there all along. And why I'm telling this story isn't about me. It's really about you. Because I want to save you 20 years (laughs) and a night with two tacos. (laughs) When do you know God's voice? When do you finally get to believe that you do? And... It's when you start paying attention to it. Believing enough that it's true. And the good news is you can start now. You don't even have to walk out of the room. It's a form of seeking God in a sense. Seeking God. Yeah, you know the Holy Spirit inside? You know the voice that he comes with? Finding that? Finding God? Dave Dwell... I won't get into the story of who he is, but he and a friend in their early years wanted to know how to hear from God. So they'd take two cars and one would head off across the city and hide. And then the other one would have to find them. You'd say, well, God wouldn't play that game with him. He did. Maybe God was telling them to do it. I don't know. I'm not saying just go do that. But I'm saying they practiced. They did that again and again and again. And they would find each other. Bing, bing, bing. You'd say, well, I trust God. I just don't trust me. I trust he's talking. I believe what he says, but I don't trust my ability to hear. And I say, you trust God, really? Then trust him when he tells you that you know his voice. Trust that. It's detectable. 
you spend time in Scripture and with the Holy Spirit's help, that sharpens you up. But you don't have to wait for someday down the road. He's talking to you today. And you can get sharper. Voice detectors. Uh, Hebrews 8. I'll skip on to verse 11. None of them, this is the new covenant documented, verse 11. None of them shall teach his neighbor and say, and none his brother saying, know the Lord. For all shall know me. This is the new covenant that he bought with his blood. This is the only covenant that you have been saved under. They shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. God is just covering all the bases here. You know Jesus. You just don't know, maybe, that you do. And you know his voice. You know his voice. And that's not only for ministry. Not only for prophetic moments in public. It's also for life. All of life. For every private moment of your existence. Fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit, a warm, intimate, hand-in-hand stroll through the park with Jesus kind of life. Wouldn't you want that? And your antenna, your spiritual antenna, I think sometimes we know, okay, I'm I'm here in a prophetic situation, they need a word from God, and we're cranking up this thing, you know. Remember my, how many of you remember my favorite Martian? Oh, yeah, good bunch of you. You know, just up the cub. Okay, ministry time's over. Down they go. No, they're supposed to stay up there. You come in with your antenna up. You leave with your antenna up. Ah, you'd say, well, that's prophecy, not healing. I'll tell you, healing works the same way. Healing comes out of simply you're cooperating with the Holy Spirit and no two healing uh, scenarios will match. Each one will be unique because God has to make it that way so we stay dependent on Him. Because God wants us to get the point that you who live by the Spirit keep in step with Him. What's keeping in step? Walking in the Spirit. Not sitting in a church service in the Spirit. Walking. You, the righteous will live by faith. I love those. A few uh, voice stitches to avoid. Uh, trying to use... Hmm. Should I stop there? A few more minutes. Should we take a vote? See, you have to do that. I know you have to do that. Okay, just a little bit more. But I could stop any time. I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to tell me, tell me what to do, right? <laughs> Where a ditch. Great, uh, those that want to learn his voice. This is one of the ditches. Is trying to use our obedience. Uh, do I wear the pink? Shoes, or do I wear the, you know, a black sweater, or trying to use obedience, but as a, and it's okay for God to tell you wear this, no wear that. That's okay. But when we try to use our obedience to God as a means of gaining more favor and blessing from Him, we've got a problem. God will never impose on you His will. He'll invite you into it. But he will never make you a robot. Never wants you to become a robot or a puppet. Never, any more than he's a puppet. See, they are totally submitted to each other in perfect free will. Nobody's a captive. Nobody's a slave. Perfect harmony. God's doing that with you. And he never wants your relationship with him to become burdensome, legalistic, and oppressive on you. So don't try to use God's voice as a ticket to buy your way out of condemnation or earn your way into power. 
It's not, Jesus did that. You don't have to do that. Uh, see, grace, I, I hear grace definitions all the time. Well, that's God's empowerment that you can do as well. It, God, it, this is what grace is. I'll give you my personal take on a good definition for grace. See, grace, the, itself, the word itself applies not only to our redemption, the starting post, but our perfection, the ending line where the race ends. Everything that comes to us is grace and nothing else. There's nobody that's earned a drop of anything from God that wasn't received as a gift. And if God would accept something that we offer to him to obligate him to us, it insults his son's sacrifice if he would do that. And he also doesn't want us to get stuck in the rut where we think that's how we get stuff from him. He would hurt us to respond to us doing that. So we, uh, we can use grace or not. We can ignore it and waste it. Or we can engage with it. But we can never earn it, deserve it. Romans 8, 11, or Romans 11, verse 6 says this. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Yeah. Now, you... This may seem really simple to you, but you need to sit on it for a few days. But if it is of works, it's no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Well, grace empowers you to obey God. It does that. Grace does this and grace does that. Yeah, it does that. But once you eliminate the component of is it earned or not, is it your work or is it Christ's work? Once you take the earned merit side of grace out of the equation, you've just lost the core of grace. If it's grace, it's not work. If it's work, it's not grace. We believe in Christ's finished work. We receive it. Then we're free to use it, whatever grace it is. Uh, or we're free to waste it. Uh, we are. And I think the Bema seat rewards for Christians is not going to be for the hard work they do. It's going to be the, for the hard work they let the grace of God do in them and through them. Ah, so don't try to earn points with God by obeying him and obeying his voice. He's simp then why obey? Because he's inviting us into the same type of companionship he shares in daily himself. He's by, inviting us into this hand-in-hand hand, hand in hand walk that's harmonious and free will that he, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit shared together. Okay, uh, faith paralysis. Five minutes and I'm done, and I promise. Can you handle five? Boy, folks that haven't been here for the last three days, these people have been revived to a rag. You know revival? <laughs> have you been to a revival and you have to go find a place to sleep as soon as you get done? I've been revived. Uh, we've been through a, a couple days and they've been awesome, but God bless the next five minutes. You get extra points for these five minutes. <laughs> Faith uh, problem solvers. Uh, it helps to get this attitude, what have I got to lose? Uh, somebody down, drives down the road and they think the Holy Spirit's saying, turn right. Now they could be, that could be their imagination. It, uh, there are crazy people out there doing a lot of crazy things because God told them to. Uh, it could be that they have psychological issues working on them. They heard some bad Christian teaching, whatever. Uh, but uh, you go, I don't know if that's grace. I don't know if that's God. My question is, however, and acknowledging that's a problem to watch out for. My question is, is it safer to withdraw our heads into our natural life turtle shells and not try to recognize God 
than it is to go through the process of learning to listen to his voice. Is it safer? I'm just going to go natural. That's safe. Safe? Your soul is at the steering wheel. Your spirit is disengaged. And you think that's safe? We've got to learn how to move with God. You and me. I'm not saying I'm a professional at this. I'm just telling you what God's telling me to tell you, and I know His voice. <laughs> not my fault, you know. Ah, you already know His voice. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 7, we won't read it, but four lepers are sitting in front of the gate saying, if we stay here, we die. If we go inside the city, we die. If we go to the enemy camp, we can die there. But they finally decide, well, all we can do is die, and we're going to die anyway, so might as well go. Now and then you're sitting in life, stuck in a spot, and you go, what have I got to lose? Well, <laughs> uh, we want to know his voice. Number two is the fear of not being perfect at it. I, I, I want to be perfect at it. I never want to make a mistake. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 29, let the two or three prophets speak, let the others judge. Remember in the Old Testament, if, they, if a prophet speaks wrong, kill him? Now he's saying there are going to be two or three prophets speaking in every church service and the others will judge. What if they decide that wasn't really too good? Do you have a pile of bodies out behind the church? What do you do with those people? Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, don't quench the spirit. Attach that is don't despise prophecies. Test all things. Isn't that comforting in a sense? God's saying, I'm not saying it's going to be perfect. Just don't throw out prophecy as a prophet, as a process, but test it all. Hold on to what's good, throw out what's not. Practice listening and then test yourself. Today you can practice listening. I think God just said. Okay, test it. See if he did. Uh, I think this is going to happen. Maybe. Uh, and this is beyond ministry listening. This is life li listening, lifestyle. Uh, you won't be perfect. Expect to learn. Um, try it. Step out. You'll grow. My suggestion is get baptized in the Spirit if you aren't yet. Speak in tongues if you don't yet. Real easy. You can do it few seconds we'll pray for you boom uh, then begin in secret with yourself don't publish your prophecies uh, later you might want to share with people you trust and and then you might want to go into a public gathering and say I think the Lord said and until the Holy Spirit is finally manifesting anywhere with anybody oh boy I'll close with this Ah, two things, I'm done. Two things, I'm done. Hold it, I'm done. I'll do the rest next week. Worship team, come on up. Worship team, come on up.